Dave, thank you for thank you for hosting this. Um, so Dave Roberts uh, works with Craft and Tull, and um, Julie Luther Kelso is also on here as well um, from Craft and Tull as well. I don't know if you have anyone from Lane Shift on this call. Is it just Craft and Tull? I think it's just us. Yes. Just you. Okay. Uh -huh. So Craft and Tull is our um, consulting firm that's working with us to develop our active transportation plan. So um, for any of you that haven't participated in our our process um, as of yet, uh, we are in the middle of updating our, our bike ped plan and we wanted to turn it into an active transportation plan. Uh, and part of that is doing these uh, walkability audits. Um, so I'm going to let Dave talk about that. Thank you. Great. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here in a minute. Um, and, and get with Katrina if you um, want to go on one of these walk audits you're going to hear me refer to if you're not already signed up. They are tomorrow and two on Friday. Um, and so that's what we're doing is this orientation. So you'll understand what it is we're looking for, some of the maybe the jargon, the planning lingo that I use when we're out there, uh, boots on the ground looking at things. So um, I've got a PowerPoint to go through. It'll take about 50 minutes um, and I'll go a little fast. So if you have questions, I think the best thing, because I won't, when I'm in my presentation mode, I can't see your faces. So maybe hold them, jot them down. And then if we, uh, I'll try to leave some time at the end and we can get to Q&A. So let me share the screen. Dave, I can also watch the chat. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right. Can you all see the presentation? Yes. Okay, cool. So, um, Let's get let's get into it. So you remember these days before COVID when everyone just freely mingled along um, the streetscape and people are starting to come back to that. Of course, we have your living windows on a Friday night there in your town. So um, that's that's going to be fun to, to be at. So this is what we're going to visit about three different sections. So the first one, just the introduction, talk about benefits of active mobility. The second one, really just visit about facility types, focusing more on the pedestrian side of things. And the third one, really more specifically about the walk audit area that we're going to be um, studying uh, in the next two days. So a lot of this seems, you know, you, you know this, it, 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 it seems pretty obvious, but, you know, active mobility um, benefits the community with regards to recreation, um, community character, health, transportation. A lot of people forget the, some of the components that are important. So I'm gonna show a few slides on each. The obvious one is recreation. You know, if your community is active, you've got good network, there's options for them to recreate in. I happen to live with, Julie and I live here in Little Rock. These are a couple of our bridges across uh, the Arkansas River, um, but you know, family activities, and it also sets up the character for your community where people start to know from maybe outside of your area, you know, are they gonna come there to do like the Katy Trail? That's, that's pretty famous, people are coming to your area to do something on the Kitty Trail, whether it's walk or ride. Um, but economic development is something that people sometimes forget about, and it's a big factor. And this is a good example in 2017, in one year window, the study that Walton Family Foundation did, they found that in one year in Northwest Arkansas, that um, their trail network, both off-road and on-road, um, soft and hard, um, it accounted for 51 million in economic activity, which meant hotels, restaurants, all, you know, bike shops, all related to cycling, walking, running, and then 86 million in health benefits, which means um, maybe less doctor's visits, maybe um, less sick days from work, because when you're active, there's a lot of those health benefits. So it's it's kind of neat to finally see the real number, the 137 million in, in really two counties, one area of Arkansas. Um, and if you haven't been up there to see some of that network, it's worth visiting. But when you talk about the health side of things, um, you know, it's interesting. If you look on the left, I, I looked up, this is the newest um, from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And I should have hit it. I was going to quiz you guys. Where's Missouri fall? You don't want to be number one. One means you're the most obese state uh, in the United States. So you can see West Virginia is at 40%, Kentucky, Alabama. This is all redone. Al Arkansas used to be third. Um, I think we we're five or six now, but uh, Missouri fell at 10. But you look at um, Colorado used to be the healthiest. Now uh, Hawaii is only 25% um, obese. And so they update this per county, um, per state every year. And if you look on the right, the one thing that we like to say as planners is we can affect the health of a community with diet and exercise, meaning providing those 
opportunities to get out, not only to recreate, but to access work through an active mobility network or housing and transit, uh, which is also that network. And so that's kind of what we're focusing on. But when we look at your two counties or where the study area is, pretty healthy. What you don't want is the darker. The darker counties in Missouri are the least healthiest. The lightest white counties are the most healthiest. And Cole County and Callaway, Cole's 14 out of 114, and Callaway is 23rd out of 114. So in this comparison, you want to be number one, or in this case, 14 or 23rd is great. So um, and that and that they research how long people live in your county and how healthy are they, how they feel when they are alive. So we talk about transportation, that's a big factor. And we like to use this graphic of a little study we did in a town in South Arkansas called Camden. And they had an old rail line run right through their town that was um, became a trail, a rail to trail project. And we helped them not only with this graphic to get a grant, but with the citywide bike and pet plan. And what I wanna focus on here are those lighter color with the gray buildings. You can see two on the upper left, you can see my cursor, and then one down here. And these are really adjacent to what became a future trail. So all the children, all the school kids that lived in neighborhoods surrounding this, cutting right through the middle of town, could then walk or ride their bikes to school because of all the schools that are in the proximity. So when you think of transportation, you don't just think of someone walking or riding their bike to work. But if we were in a room together, I'd ask you to raise your hand how many people rode or walked their bike to school. Um, and, and of course, the older folks in the room tend to put their hands up. I'm in my 50s and I did that in suburbia, Miami, Florida. We all rode to elementary school. And now you would ask how many of your kids or grandkids walk or ride. And, and it's very, very few numbers. So transportation is really important. And the infrastructure, it has to be a commitment. You know, you look on the right, that could be anywhere in Arkansas, Missouri. It could be a city bus stop or it could be a, a school bus stop. And if it's a rainy day, you got a giant patch of mud. Good luck if you're in a wheelchair or pushing a stroller trying to get onto a bus. Um, whereas on the left, you've got a network that really makes sense for all users, pedestrians and, and cyclists. So we'll talk about complete streets. Really, my last point um, is inclusion. Equity goes into that as well. But when we think about active mobility, we have to remember that not everyone has the same mobility um, options. Sometimes they may be someone that's born with a disability. They may be seniors that need a walker. They may be like the top middle, uh, a grandparent or a person that came back from active duty in the military that has some paralysis or even just a stroller um, when you think about you know, the barriers in the built environment. And when you, when you think about inclusion and inclusive mobility, um, we're talking about a lot of people. We're talking about in, in America, that graphic on the left, um, about 19% of the population. And that's not just physical, 31 million is the physical, 7.6 is hearing, 2 million um, are vision impaired and, and 8.1 have difficulty with vision. But that's a pretty big spectrum that we have to think about. And the one thing to realize is that any one of us could join that group with a car accident or any other health issues tomorrow. Um, and so that number fluctuates and, and, and continues to grow, especially as, uh, as Americans as we age. Um, so we use the, fortunately, 2010 is the most recent ADA standards um, from the federal government, and those are still in use for um, urban design, um, architecture, all the design components, engineering of our uh, infrastructure. And so why is inclusion important? Well, it's real important to me because this is my daughter. I have one child, her name's Alex, and she is um, she has cerebral palsy, and she was born with that, and she operates a power wheelchair. Um, we, she keeps us pretty busy with all of her activities. She's now in, in, at a community college. Um, but, you know, what we have learned is to find devices that she can use, not just a power wheelchair, but even a bicycle that was really made for special needs where she's harnessed in, her feet are strapped down. And so when I push from behind, um, she can, uh, the, the, her legs then go into motion or I could disable the chain. It even has a canopy. I forgot the canopy when I realized that my golf club fell on the back and used it as a push cart. And we went out and played golf quite a few years back. And she was burning up. It was in July, so she doesn't like golf now. But um, it's a, yeah, sad story. Um, but this is her current device. She has a newer one, a different color. But um, what I show you this for is because technology can do amazing things. And we've got chairs now that she can actually stand up in for therapy. Or if she's seated, she can scissor lift up to 
um, our eye level. Um, and, it, and it has headlights and taillights, and it's really an amazing device. But as we look at the built environment, if we have barriers in the built environment, it doesn't matter unless she's going to get to us eventually one day of a hoverboard, something from Back to the Future or Star Wars. We have to think about our pedestrian and cycling spaces and what safeties that we provide and following those ADA guides. So let's talk about those facilities. We'll first talk about a walkability um, and what we call as designers universal design. It means it's, it's for everybody, regardless of your ability, inability, or age. Universal design is what our engineers, architects, landscape architects, planners are all having to follow. And you can see those bullets. If you're talking about an intersection with regards to sidewalks or trails or access, it's what are your what's your signage, what's your your markings, um, turn radius for that curb, um, you know, your crossing times. And you can see in that graphic, see, I need to look at this screen. You can see in the graphic we've got um, some sound sensors. If you've been to some cities, I'm not sure if Jefferson City has it, but you either hear bird chirping or you'll hear a voice saying wait uh, to help any of those that are visually impaired. Um, you know, obviously we got striping and the medians and and all of these things are to make sure that everyone um, has equal opportunity to be safe when they're um, out in the in the built environment. And so what we're going to be doing the next two days is this, a walk audit. Uh, we're going to do, like I said, one tomorrow, two on Friday. And this is what to expect. You get free of charge, these stylish vests that you get to borrow. <laughs> Don't get to keep them. Um, and this is to keep us all safe. Uh, you'll see I'll carry a measuring wheel. We'll double check some measurements of certain things. Um, and if you like, even the bottom right, you look at the height of that curb and and a lot of it is just chipping away and they don't have a, a curb cut over here. It doesn't line up on the top left. It's So we're going to look at access and barriers and 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 even, you know, things that are done well, too. It's not just going to be all doom and gloom. And I'm certainly not coming to your town to make fun or or try to point out something to embarrass anyone at the city. Um, it's really just look let's look at ways to improve the built environment. A lot of times I'll have like on the left, the top and bottom photo, I'll have folks that are with me, whether they're friends or someone from the community um, that's in a chair. And that's real eye opening for the group as we're walking to see that they can't get from point A to B that we just did, didn't even think about. They got to go down and half a block and over and back up or have to get around a utility box or a power pole. And so just that exposure and you'll hear me refer to if my daughter was with us, we'd have to do this here. Um, if we don't have someone with a mobility device, but and so we're gonna um, we're gonna take notes, take photos when we're out there, um, and then try to give uh, an abbreviated report that will go into the overall document. So when we talk about facilities. Um, I'm gonna run through just some of these. Uh, you may know a lot of these, and you may not. And so uh, hopefully, maybe this will be educational. Some of the obvious ones are sidewalks, right? Um, and I use this picture as an example. I'm going to show you a before and after. This is in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, which is a suburb of Tulsa. We did some work in their downtown area. Now, I can't claim we did this redesign. We we did a sidewalk study for them. Another firm did the after shot. But I still love it just because of some of the solutions that they found. If you look in the road, you'll see there's a four-lane road. You see angle parking, a sidewalk that's relatively standard. It's, I would consider it a little bit narrow. Because if you look at those little planters and some of the displays from the shops, they're kind of in the way a little bit. Um, and then you've got the awnings and and the old overhead light fixtures. And so when you think about that space, if you're a pedestrian, your space is pretty narrow. If you're a vehicular, you got a huge cross section of where you can drive and park. Well, these businesses, most of them were going under. There was very few shops that were left in this four block area because of the big boxes that are beyond that church steeple. About another um, maybe six blocks is an interstate. There's all the big boxes out there. And so this was their redesign. I'm standing basically in the same place. And you can now see there's a nice, decently wide pedestrian zone, but also they've added that amenity zone um, and then upgraded all the utilities with nice power pole, light poles with banner arms um, and even vehicular lights. And they took the four lane to two. They still have the angle parking. Um, but now when you think about these shop owners, they now have the people they want to see get out of their car and come to their shops and walk up and down the sidewalk um, and maybe even be able to maybe have a little more room to display their wares. So I'll go back so you can see the before and after. And it's just a matter of 
who are you catering to? If you're a downtown area, just like up on a high street in, your, in Jefferson City, it's all about the shoppers and the pedestrians and the crossings and the safety. Um, and so kudos to Broken Arrow, it's hugely successful. And just now this is you know 12 years after it's happened, maybe 10 years, all the shops are completely full and they've even started now, or a few years back, all the upper floors are um, either little condos, rental units and or other shops above. And so it's just booming to the point where they renamed this area, they rebranded themselves the Rose District. And you can see those planters all have roses in them. Um, so again, it's all about the pedestrian and their importance. And you have to make sure it makes sense. The shot on the left, I think both of these shots are in Memphis, but the one on the left is what I used to see when I was in college in Fayetteville, Arkansas. We call those cow pads. It showed the, the facilities where they needed to pave because that's where everyone's walking. Or on the right, you can also see it's just deferred maintenance. And if you're pushing a stroller, you know, or in a wheelchair, good luck. It's it's not easy. And so let's talk about crosswalks because crosswalks are pretty important. Um, we're going to talk specifically about where we're going to walk at the end of this presentation, and I'll talk more about crosswalks. But if you look at that graphic in the middle, that gray and white, you know, I really prefer there to be those crossbars, um, whether they're like this, like diagonal. T more typically, you'll see kind of the vertical. Most towns, a lot of times, will just have these two sidebars um, that show a car where the pedestrian zone is. But over time, those get worn out by the, the vehicle wheels rolling over them to a point where they start to just fade away. So I think the more signals you can give motorists, the better. Um, and if you look at this, this image on the top right and the bottom right, that's all about creating, we call it a, a median refuge island. And so top middle, if you're going to walk across that street like those two folks are doing, you're looking both directions and you're worried about scooting all the way across as quick as you can. That's a pretty wide cross section. Same road, there's new infrastructure put in, including that center median. It allows you to start at the same place, looking left at that brown car. Don't worry about the other direction because you can get to the middle, take a breath, regroup, look right only, and then cross that rest of it. So it, it really makes it safer for everybody, the pedestrians and the motorists, um, because by narrowing the road down with that island, it slows the, the motorists down too. Psychologically, the narrower a road is, the slower people go, the wider, straighter it is. Just by accident, people just speed up and go fast. So, so there's little techniques that you can use down here on the bottom right in New York. They angled it to really accentuate which way you're looking as you're coming into that, looking uh, left or right. Um, and I do include this photo on the left of the, the wheelchair user only because having a daughter in one and, and taking her all over the country, we travel a lot. She has told me she does not like the stamp concrete because um, she has a headrest. This, this gentleman doesn't have one, but um, it bangs her head against her headrest with every single little joint that she goes over. So she's not a big fan of those. That doesn't mean don't do them, but, but I just like to share that anecdote that um, sometimes when you're trying to get fancy, some of the users may not even love it. And then another important crosswalk, uh, more others to consider are um, the top two are the same, and I'll explain those. And the bottom one's called a hawk signal. Um, it's it's activated by push buttons, usually around um, trail networks like a greenway that might cross a wide road. And it looks just like traffic lights, but you can stop the traffic with the push button, but otherwise it's dark. And so it's really just push activated. But the two on the top um, are a little less expensive than the hawk signal. And just, I think, equally as important. Up on High Street, you have some of these. Um, so these are called uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons. And it's referring to those um, yellow and white that flash back and forth whenever they're either pushed or uh, the upper right, which is Broken Arrow again. In that redesigned road, you've got um, these bollards that have sensors. So when someone, person, dog, whatever, breaks the plane of that, it operates this rapid flashing beacon here and stops motorists. And these beacons are really useful in mid-block crossing. So we're not at a corner, although this one's a little deceiving because it is. But if you look at this middle, uh, the right image, the blocks are 400 feet long. You have shoppers that are kind of going from shop to shop and they may look and say, I want to get across the street. Most people are going to walk all the way to the corner, another 200 feet to cross and then come back 200 feet. 
So again, just like on High Street, you'll have these um, as a mid-block crossing. And yes, they did do stamp concrete here, um, but that's okay. And it works really well with their design. And another technique that you can use to be safe, that to help with the safety of pedestrians are curb extensions. You hear them called bulb out sometimes. Upper left is a good example of how that would look um, on a street. And what it does is if that bulb out wasn't there, you have these cars still parked along the road, you'd be back here trying to cross the entire length of the road, really from this corner to that corner um, to get from sidewalk to sidewalk. Whereas if you do these curb extensions, um, you're narrowing that space that the pedestrians have to cross. Um, you're also providing a little bit of protection uh, for the car so that if, if a parked car is in that parallel spot and the cars come around that, that broad radius, um, there's no protection. So it really protects everyone. And again, we narrow the road down so the motorists psychologically feel like going a little slower as they're entering into that intersection instead of it being wide open. Um, and then you've got the, the what we call curb cuts. That's what, what you see here. These are um, have the, the yellow strip that have truncated domes on them. That's the technical term for all the little kind of braille looking um, domes that make up the, the feel of that for anyone who's visually impaired. And those are uh, anywhere there's a change of surface, you're going to notarize someone who's visually impaired that they're going to be stepping out into the road. You will also see those strips along a subway platform or anywhere there's an edge to let them know um, those rubber strips, strips will help signify it. And as you can see in the bottom right, you can still do it with um, angle parking. It just looks a little different, um, but still provides that same safety and less distance for the, for the pedestrian. And then when we talk about facilities, I can't forget to get on my soapbox just for a minute and talk about the importance of accessible parking as a parent um, that needs that. That's our, our old van. We have the same model, so it does the same thing. And I just wanted you to see that when we uh, park to pull my daughter out in her power wheelchair, I need a photo of her in her chair. Her chair comes all the way out to here easily before we can turn to get her on the sidewalk. The irony of this photo is it's in front of our office building here in Little Rock. They've redone the striping because they redid the parking lot. These are now correct and look like this down below with the actual loading zone instead of just them slapping down paint and calling it good to meet their numbers. Um, it is correct now. But that's the reason for that load zone. And typically, they're the width of somewhere around 10 feet, the width of a normal parking stall just because of uh, that device. And even if it's you know someone with, with a walker or someone loading on the other side, uh, if they're the, the driver, um, you still need to account for the length of that device as well as the length of the ramp. And so this is important. Um, I've got another slide that's not worked in here, but um, in other presentations, I'll, I'll I'll make mention that some people um, choose to just park in these when they don't they're not supposed to, or you know kindly park on the striping um, when we come out and we can't um, load our daughter in and we have to back out in the traffic just to try to get her into the van. So um, these are important, uh, and and our fallback are these cones. If we go to a place like a Home Depot and maybe it's during Christmas and all the accessible parking is taken, and we just have our cones in the back and we'll just park way out on the edge and put those in place to protect us. So, and as we talk about facility types, I'll just mention a few of the um, bicycle facilities. Uh, really the walk audits are, they're about bicycle and pedestrian both, but we focus a lot more on the pedestrian. But here you've got standard bike lanes on the left, both um, up above is the elevation, below is the plan. Um, you've also got sidewalks. So this is really a complete street. On the right, you've got a cycle track. This photo is from, right next to the, um, the Beltline in Atlanta. And so they've got some cycle tracks that come off the Greenway. Um, and on the on the bottom left, I, I like to point out, because a lot of towns don't have bike boxes. I don't remember if Jefferson City has any, but you see these in, in, in larger cities, DC, um, San Francisco, Seattle. And that's if a cyclist is coming up to an intersection, they're allowed to get in front of the car in their bike box. So they dictate where they're going when the light turns. So if they go straight or if they turn, otherwise, if they're sitting right here and this car just isn't paying attention, doesn't know what they're doing, and they decide they're gonna go straight, this car can then just turn right into them and take them out. So um, it's a nice, nice little feature. And then of course, anytime you can get separation from a road, 
Um, and even in this case, separation of speeds, this is in Tulsa along the river trail. They've got, they took their old, old trail system and basically doubled it so that you've got a higher speed for the cyclists or folks on scooters, the lower speed for the walkers, dog walkers, strollers, and sometimes skateboarders. And all of it is pretty well lit. So it's really your, your Cadillac version. And then as we talk, put it all together, um, just so you know, complete streets is the term for um, when, it, when it all comes into play together. So you're accommodating a cyclist, a motorist, even a bus, uh, as well as the pedestrian. And this top image is from an AARP brochure. Uh, they love it because all of their members are seniors and they like not being run over by bikes that shouldn't be on a sidewalk or someone going super fast. So you, you kind of separate those speeds and those users um, and, and really make it a lot safer. And the bottom right kind of shows you that in, a, in an urban setting. Some towns don't like to put the bike lanes next to the cars because of dooring where a door might open into a, a cyclist. Um, and so there's different ways to approach that. But just in general, this is what complete streets are. And if you haven't read it yet, I'll read you this quote. I love it. When you design your cities around cars, you get more cars. When you design your cities around people, you get more people. And so it's really thinking about the safety of your community um, and not just being car dependent on everything you do, because that equals speed and you know complexity and, and obviously unsafe uh, environments. Not everyone owns a car. You talk about equity. You might have quite a few people in your town that are going to take um, uh, transit or they're going to walk or ride a bike. So uh, it's providing for everybody. So I, I don't know where this is. I borrowed this from the internet. I would guess it's somewhere up north. It kind of looks Detroit-ish. Um, and it's a before and after of a downtown that um, was ripe for a redesign. And then you'll see a graphic overlay that shows what a complete street looks like. So you've got four travel lanes on street parking. You've got kind of average width for the sidewalk. If you look at these corners, these curb cuts, if you're a pedestrian, you've got to cross all the way across that the curb extension. You'll see will help that distance. That's pretty far distance. In this case, of course, the, like I mentioned to you before, your, your crosswalk striping gets worn down with vehicles going over it, so you barely even see where it is. Um, and there's no shade. There's no beautification. And you look at the after, and this would be making that a complete street. So you take those four lanes and just take them down to two if the volume uh, of the road warranted that. You'd add the bike lanes, you could widen the sidewalks, add some beautification, shade, lighting. You do these bulb outs, these curb extensions, and now you're only having to cross here to here. You really cut your distance in half. And these curb cuts line up with the direction you're going this way or that way before the one on the corner where that man is standing, it's just dumping you into the middle of the intersection, really, uh, and calling it good. And that we see that a lot of towns when they had to do ADA upgrades to the sidewalks. A lot of times initially they would just do these retro instead of actually doing it the right way where you're you're, you're safely directing where someone is gonna go. Um, so it's kind of a neat little before and after so you can understand a complete street. And it really, it's just about the approach. Uh, you know, who, who's on the road? If you look at the cartoon graphic on the right, you've got, Everyone thinks about a street as being four cars, right? Four trucks or buses. Really, the street is for users. So the cars and trucks are just one part of the equation. You know, you've got the mobility, the people walking, riding a bike, kids that are playing. And then what happens next to the street is really important, whether it's a school, it's a house, it's a neighborhood, it's a park. Um, and all of that, obviously static, it's not moving, but you've got mobile users that are the most vulnerable with regards to the speed and the the dangers of a vehicle. So streets play a lot of roles and a lot of, you were to pull everyone in your town, you would say, what are streets for? Your response would probably be for cars, which I argue is incorrect. And so it's just about what is on that street. Is it a quality of place that you've created, the, the transportation options and the quality of life for the people that live in that town? So we're, we're on the home stretch here. This is the, the last section. And I apologize if I'm talking too fast. Uh, I just want to leave some time for some Q&A. So we're going to talk about um, really the infrastructure of the study area that we're going to look at in the next two days and then just leave with a few closing slides. And so um, obviously here's your, your community and this is really the, the, the limits of the, 
um, the bike and ped master plan uh, project, we're zooming in to here. Um, so here's, uh, you know, your US 63, City Hall is right here. Uh, that's the hotel we usually stay at right by City Hall. I believe Katrina can correct me if I'm wrong. I think we're going to walk over there. So we're looking at a few blocks to get there down Monroe Street. And then we're going to do this Dunklin, Jefferson, Ashley, um, and Madison. This is where, let's see, let me get oriented here. Yep. Um, this is where that ice cream shop mm -hmm. is. I forgot the name of it. Central Dairy. Yes, the Central Dairy, which I have yet to try. So I am making that a mission. Um, in the next few days, I got to go there. So, yeah. Hey, Dave. Uh, yeah. Can you hear me? I did want to say um, we would actually be walking probably down Miller to Madison Street and then coming south. Um, okay. For a okay. couple reasons. The sidewalk is pretty obliterated on Monroe Street. I was going to um, show you that. I got a slide on the then, sidewalk. Yeah. And then actually the entire road is uh, peeled up um, okay. between so, Madison and Monroe right now. So, so we're coming this way. Okay. Yeah, That's we'll come fine. down Madison. That's fine. That's fine. It's probably safer anyhow. So um, funny you should mention that because I'm first going to talk about sidewalks, and I was looking at Monroe and Madison, um, and and just sort of the again, I'm not making fun of things to um, embarrass the city or the MPO or anyone else. It's just an outside outsider's point of view of if I were in your town as a visitor or as a resident, and I'm going to walk up this road or any of these roads, really, what does it what does it look and feel like? And it's not real good on Monroe, and so. You kind of stole a little of my thunder. I was going to point all this out while we're walking along and talk <laughs> about like why it happened or what, you know, maybe what, what could be some other solutions, but that's okay. You all get to see it here and then we'll see other stuff um, tomorrow and Friday. But, you know, I, I understand and maybe if the, a wall or erosion occurs and sometimes things are temporary, a lot of times I get the feel that temporary becomes semi-permanent uh, because people just get used to it. Um, and even on this side, you don't have... A, really a lot of bailout. You've got those Jersey barriers right on the wall. And so anyhow, we've got some pretty rough conditions on Monroe. Um, you get on Madison, and this is right in where we're going to walk. Um, Central Dairy is just down another block. And uh, what the reason I, I show you this picture, because if you're on a sidewalk or even on a bike, um, these are scary. When you have giant wide open parking entrances, you don't know when a car is gonna turn into it and where they're gonna turn in. And if they're paying attention to you. Now, the thing to think about is if you're in a wheelchair, especially if you're by yourself, you're at sitting height, you're not very tall. Some chairs you'll see, you'll even put a safety flag on the back. But if you're in a wheelchair and you're, you're cruising along here and someone doesn't notice you and turns in, not good, right? So we like to see codes and ordinances that require um, choking these entrances down um, and really making a, a, like a logical setup for the parking lot. So it's a lot safer for the sidewalk users. Um, and they're made, and, and I don't know the details and David could probably interrupt and say, oh, well, this is that, whatever. They're redesigning and they're going, they got an ordinance or, uh, you know, variance or whatever it might be. But a lot of times places will grandfather in with the way it used to be, unless they make big changes to their building, they don't have to upgrade. Um, and so that that might be the case here, but I wanted to point that out that sometimes just gets overlooked as a pedestrian. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Hey, we had um, a comment, a question come in from Eric Landwehr, and he says, and it's backing up to the bulb outs, and he said, the bulb outs are great for pedestrians, but can be difficult for pickups and larger SUVs to make a right turn when there's a vehicle in the opposite lane, you know, from where you're turning in. Do you have yeah. a suggestion for a radius that can accommodate both pedestrians and vehicles? Well, we will get to that. Uh, right after okay. the crosswalk, I do the, the curb extension. So we will, we'll, let's talk about that next. You've already seen these images, uh, some vast slides, but just again, um, I think your better crosswalks are going to have good, um, whether it's decal or painting, to really signify here's where the crossings are. And when you look at the picture on the bottom right, there's the reason. And we're not just talking about a person in a wheelchair. We're talking about people that are children going to school that are seniors pushing a walker um, and what's the timing of um, a crosswalk itself if you push the button is it enough time and is it visual um, and so we look at our study area this is Dunklin and Jefferson you can see the stop bars where the cars are told their wheels need to stop behind that but there's no crosswalks now let me give the caveat I took this from Google Earth I don't know it. they could have painted them this past year so I, I can't 
I can't speak to that. But um, we're back here on Ashley. There's nothing on Ashley, not even faded. And so as we talk about crossing and when we get out there and walk on a road, and maybe we'll catch it at a busy time because there's quite a few lanes. See how you feel, you know, when you just step out and 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 let's say the timing, if we do have any, I don't think these have the push buttons, but if they do, does it give you enough time? And um, and then imagine if you're an eight-year-old or you're with your, you know, 80, my mom's 84, you're trying to get across this with her. Um, again, it's just safety and consideration for the pedestrian. So we will be looking at that. Here's a street shot of it. And how does that look and feel when traffic is zooming by? And do the motorists even notice where someone's supposed to cross? Typically what happens is you'll have a crosswalk painted in in front of the stop bar um, and you'll see motorists will creep into that crosswalk. And as you drive the next few days, notice if you do that yourself because we all do it. We don't think about it. We do it so we can see a little bit better down the road, both left and right. And then we realize, oh my gosh, I'm sitting in the crosswalk. And that happens a lot. And again, if you're a wheelchair user, you don't have a lot of options. If a curb cut dumps you into a crosswalk, um, it may mean you got to go out almost to the middle of the intersection to get around a car that's sticking out. And yet you're at seated height and how well are you seeing? Um, I did notice that these curb cuts dump to the intersection. See over here on the, on the right, they're not lined up to cross you in the direction you need to go. Now on the other side of the street, I can see that one looks correct. Um, and so it depends on the age of the intersection and, and the infrastructure and what the capital improvements plan shows to do improvements on, but I think it's important. And if you're going to add crosswalks, you have to make sure those curb cuts happen in the right place. And this is up at um, Jefferson and Ashley. And this is where we're going to turn on our walk and go down Ashley. Um, when you have grade changes, when you have um, a hill, even more a reason to have these crosswalks. If someone is coming up this hill, it may be a little bit more blind to see someone who's crossing back here, or vice versa, if someone's coming down a hill from where we're viewing, and they're going to come down this hill a little bit faster, but someone's crossing right here, we really need to be thinking about the pedestrian safety. And look at these, these curb cuts, and I know it sounds like I'm making fun. I'm, I'm really not. I'm just showing age infrastructure that really needs some TLC to, to fix these, and we're going to look at them and just say, how, how well would you do on these if you're pushing a stroller or you're in a power wheelchair? So here we go. So um, curb extensions. You know, the good thing about curb extensions is it forces a car to slow down. And I, and I get the point of an SUV or um, even a semi truck, it makes it really tough. But what we find is when you don't have a curb extension in an urban setting, people go too fast and they will cut that corner. Um, and so, yeah, these are tight radiuses and I, I don't wanna throw out numbers without you know really checking with our engineers on what they find is normal. I think it depends on the road depends on the volume of the traffic and the average daily trips on that road. Um, you might use a different radius if this is a state or US highway or a main city road than you would if it was like Ashley, which is a much smaller smaller road. And by the way, I didn't mention this before, you really only use these curb extensions when you have parallel parking. You can use them otherwise, but it really is tailor-made for that, like up on High Street. Um, and so, Point well taken on that radius. I I see what you're saying on a, on an SUV. What yeah. unfortunately what's happening? Would, you know, yeah, okay. I would say it's even a even a bigger problem made with trash trucks. Yeah, trash truck. Um, Quite I, big. I, and, and that and that's a valid point. But um, what you find is um, we find with uh, the semis, the biggest trucks that have the biggest issue is that Google Maps is the worst enemy. It'll tell that truck driver whether they're in a UPS truck or whether they're um, you know, supplying something on an 18 wheeler to a restaurant or a grocery store, it'll give them the quickest, easiest route to go. And it's usually not the best one for them. And so um, we found that on projects that we were doing some urban design um, on a main street in a small town where trucks were being routed up a road they didn't need to be on at all. Um, but they couldn't help it because they put it in and it would tell them this is where you need to go. But I did want to show you, I mean, I found in your town, there's some cases of some bulb outs in this case to for a, a crossing. Um, you know, you've got some parallel parking that's occurring on the street. That cross street's Lafayette. I'm not sure what this, this is on Capitol. Okay. 
Yeah. So, um, and I know up on High Street, you have some uh, quite a few curb extensions where it totally makes sense with, especially with the mid block crossings. Um, and so, if we look in plan view or you know aerial, there's the central dairy. So you can see this is Dunklin and Madison, I think here. Mm -hmm. um, and back to the crosswalk, you can see some is still visible. Some of it's getting worn off with the traffic. If it had those cross bars, I think it would be even more visible for a motorist. The other intersection up above at Jefferson is the one I was pointing out in the previous slides in the crosswalk. But here, what I wanted to show you was the the road widens for a turn lane. You got two turn lanes coming in. So if you had bul bulb outs, say you were going to do a mid block crossing here, you could still do it. You'd lose one of your parallel parking spots. Um, but it gets tricky to do it down close to a corner. When you look at this, we're on a corner doing them. Easier to do when it's just standard widths, no turn lanes. You get to the turn lanes, the road has to even be widened more to allow for those stacking of those cars in the turn lane. So it's trickier. Now, I did notice you could do it on this road, on Madison, um, and I'll show you why. I've got that image. So there's parallel parking right here on the left. You can see a car down closer to Central Dairy that's parallel parked. You certainly could do a bulb out here, which takes you out to the edge of that drive lane, and then bring it in, and then this is where a car would park. Um, and it, again, it allows for a shorter distance for the pedestrians to cross. Doesn't work as well on this side, but that's okay. You can do it on one side and not the other, depending on what your traffic patterns are. Um, it just provides that little extra safety zone for the pedestrian. So it could be occurring on Madison. And maybe, it, maybe it's not perfect for Dunklin in this particular setting. Um, this is on Dunklin um, around the corner. So wait, this is, I'm, look, I'm, I'm here where this tree is looking towards the west, towards Jefferson. And you can see that that's where that road widened a little for the turn lane. You could have one right here. And you could, you could um, have another, if you needed that mid-block crossing, you could have it. Now, what I noticed is there's a, um, I think it's a, it's a uh, florist, and they kind of X'd out their delivery pickup spots. And so they, you know, wouldn't want anything there uh, in their loading zone. Um, but it still can occur even in the middle of blocks if it doesn't work as well in the corners. And and the reason I really liked walking, we're going to walk in this area. There's some great things that are happening in this section, but we'll get up around the corner as I showed you over on Ashley and Jefferson, where there's some stuff that's just not. So it's a really good area for us to see good and bad all together in one walk. And then, as I mentioned, I got I to gotta talk about accessibility a little bit. I was really disappointed. I cannot find any on-street accessible spots in this whole area. Um, and I found that pretty surprising. Now, you'll see that, you know, private industry, the, the commercial retail, they have to have them. Now, if they're a parking lot like this one has been there for 80 years, you're not going to find it. Um, if it's been upgraded, if it's newer, in this parking lot, we should see some. Uh, I know at, up at this height, you're probably like, wow, I can't even, how could I see them? But I zoomed in and out, and I could not find any parallel spots that were accessible parking uh, in this area. And, and, you know, it's a shame because, again, we weren't just talking about a 2% like a code might call for. We might be talking about 19% of the population that really needs some of that help. Um, and so if I'm with my daughter and I'm circling this road looking for a place to park because I want to go to this florist, I might have a tough time because I can't offload her ramp if I don't have a space that's really set up to help us. So it's something to think about. Up on High Street, there you are. You got one right there. I know there's probably quite a few of them up here. So we're looking at a, a part of town that's been more recently renovated versus maybe down on Dunklin, Jefferson, Madison Monroe. Maybe some of it has some age and it just hasn't caught up. Um, so I'm not, again, making fun of the city. I'm just saying it's good when I can see those. Sometimes it's tricky to get a vehicle um, to offload that's right as the first one of um, at, at these bulb outs. Um, but to have one at all is just is great. So I, you know, I shouldn't I shouldn't complain. Um, so these are my closing slides. I just wanted to leave a few thoughts with you. According to Housing and Urban Development, according to our federal government, the average working American spends nearly 60% of the budget on housing and transportation. So think about your household. Unless you're retired, 
odds are you probably have multiple vehicles in your family, especially if you have any teenage or college age kids, you probably have a house um, payment, guessing, uh, or at least a rent. And so you add the, the transportation costs and that housing costs, and that might fluctuate between 40 to 60%, but that's your average working American. So what? Is, let's say COVID didn't calm down, or let's say gas prices were hitting $8 a gallon, $10 a gallon. Would you change how you operate? Would you work from home? Would you um, maybe not commute, maybe drive less, maybe only have one car in the household? And if that's the case, would it make sense to live in a more urban setting where you're maybe in condos, apartments, or lofts above retail, where you can work, walk for all your goods and services, you can walk your kids to school, you could walk to the restaurant. Um, and that's and that's just to get people thinking about what if. There's a lot of Americans that want what I'm showing you here, regardless of the gas price or COVID conditions. Uh, and so we're starting to see a lot of mixed use coming back into the downtown areas, like I showed you in Broken Arrow, where those loft apartments and condos are coming in above those retail shops. Because what we find is the baby boomers that are seniors have a lot of the same outlook as the millennials and Gen Z that are coming in right out of college or, or in the early workforce. And so this is popular. It's less about the picket fence and the, you know, half acre around them uh, in the suburbia than it is about um, their options for walkability and bikeability. And, and, I'll, and I'll show you this as the last slide. And this is one more time, Broken Arrow. You can see the Rose District in all its glory. Um, and there's a show two years ago on HGTV called Hometown Takeover. They didn't do this town, but they did a small town that they took block by block and redesigned it with some of the HGTV um, co-stars from all their multiple shows. And each week they did a different one. One week they might do the inside of a building. The next week they did a block. The next week they did another you know, street. And so if you want to Google that or look for that on, on YouTube, it was really fun to watch those. Uh, and that the last episode was their full block transformation. And what they asked the different um, shop owners to do is get friends and family and volunteer. And they painted their doors different colors to make it kind of fun. They all got together and talked about how their signage would look different, but be similar. So someone walking and driving could see the different shops. They talked about string lights across the road on a road they could close off for festivals um, and what their fixtures look like. And it was just about consistency and, and just ease of kind of visual, less clutter. Um, and it was a really cool episode about everything that we just talked about, about safety and beautification. So uh, if you get a chance, maybe look that up. And did I leave time? I leave, yeah, perfect. I left nine minutes for any Q&A that, that you all might have. Or not, we can just chat. <laughs> So was it like drinking from a fire hose or is just a lot of stuff rapid fire and you're still absorbing it? Okay. I, I, um, this is a really clear uh, presentation of the problems in communities. This is somewhere I walk all the time. Uh, is Can we get this online or YouTube or something to uh, share with other people that didn't take part in this? Yes. Uh, well, I, I say yes. I'll leave that up to Katrina, our client. But we recorded this. This is still recording. Um, and so I will get her that recording. And Campo can do whatever they want with it. If they want to put it on their website or, or put it on YouTube or wherever, you can share it. Um, if not, um, I don't mind if they send you a copy if you want that. So um, the only thing I, I, I am protective of my daughter's image is in there. And so I don't you'll see a lot of text. I don't show her name or anything. And keep in mind that I narrated this whole thing. If it's a recording, you're going to get that narration. Um, if it's shared as a PDF, a lot of times our slides have a lot of images and less words. And so um, the recording will help you there. We'll definitely put that on our website, Dave. So okay. thank you so much for, cool. for all yeah. of that. I'll put yeah. it on our project page. So that's the jeffersoncitymode.gov slash campo. Good. And I, and, I, and I do look forward to seeing all this in person. There's times where I look on Google Earth and I see the streetscape that you are looking at right here. Um, and I nitpick on certain things and I get out there and it's either been upgraded or if it hasn't, it maybe 
isn't as bad as I thought when I get boots on the ground, or I find places that are worse. And I'm like, wow, this is really dangerous. And I really like to do walk audits where mayors, city managers, city engineers are involved. Because what I try to tell them is, again, I'm not trying to be mean and make fun. I'm trying to avoid a lawsuit. I mean, you have things in your city that could be pretty dangerous to some of your citizens that if we can point them out and we can get improvements made, even if they're not high dollar, fancy improvements, um, we can avoid problems down the road, whether it is someone being injured or whether it is a potential lawsuit. Well, I will stop sharing Katrina, and stop recording if we don't have any other uh, Katrina, any other questions. I think, how you're, I, think all, I think we're all looking forward to it. So thank you very much, Dave. Really appreciate it. No, thank you all. We had someone trying to chime in here. Okay. Yeah, sorry, Katrina. I was just curious if you, uh, as far as your attendance at each of your blocks that you've got scheduled for this, what's your availability on that? Uh, I'm not oh, sure we, how much of our staff knew knew these were going on, and if there's yeah, availability in different blocks, I I can go hit up some more to see if. Yeah, we have plenty of space. I think uh, the one on Thursday, that's the one that's at two forty five. That one, we probably have space for another ten people in that one, and then on Friday, um, probably ten to fifteen per. Um, okay. per segment. So, so I think there's plenty of room unless you're going to send all of MoDOT over here. <laughs> right, right. Well, I might, I might just quiz some of our design staff. It, it's a good experience to go. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm looking forward to it. I know we've done one of these up in Columbia and, and uh, had some good results from it. So anyway, I'll do a little outreach to see. You know, yeah. we're really hoping for more elected officials to participate and we really appreciate that um, one of our city council members is participating and, and I know there's conflicting schedules and things, but um, we're, we're happy to have anybody who wants to attend. So. Yeah, and I'm married. glad we're doing three different ones. Um, I do these all over Arkansas and I've done, I don't know, 30 plus over 10 years. And what I, I, I don't like is when someone just blasts it out on social media and I get about 30 people come out. It's hard for everyone to hear me and you get little, little conversations going on in the big group. It's nice if the group is under 20. Um, and by having three of these in the same place, yes, I'll sound like a broken record if you go to all three of them with me, but I think it allows us to have, you know, 60 people to be exposed to it um, as opposed to limiting it to just 20 or under. Yeah. 